Hey guys, Frank Spear back with you today for another episode, if we want to use that term, another episode of Watch This. I just watched a video that was disheartening to me by someone who was a full preterist and who struggled with particular passages and a particular understanding of passages and therefore has left the full preterist movement and went back to some form of futurism, that there was a future judgment coming, a future resurrection, so forth. And his reasoning for doing so is basically this. If preterism says, full preterism, says that uh, the judgment took place in A.D. 70, and therefore the sanctification, the glorification, the justification, all of those biblical things having to do with soteriology, salvation, if that all took place in A.D. 70, then what's left for us? If the final judgment, the appeasement of God's wrath, happened in A.D. 70, then there's nothing left for us. Therefore, it could not have happened in A.D. 70. It has to be yet future, or we're out. Well, I don't think that's the case at all. I think those things did happen, and the exact opposite is true. That's the reason we're in because those things happen. So I want to take time to explain that today to the best of my ability. I may alienate some people uh, because of the position I hold, but what else is new, right? I mean, uh, who among us agrees on uh, every point here? Uh, that's just the truth about Christianity in general, isn't it? There are so many sects and divisions among uh, the church at large that why should I be any different? But this is my understanding of it in all the years I've been looking at the scriptures, and I'm always open to correction and further light, but uh, let's just do it. I see that work of Jesus Christ, to sum up in a sentence, the work of Christ was to be the final sacrifice for national ethnic Israel under the old covenant system. He was their final sacrifice. He was the one who wrapped everything up for them, who concluded all things and put all things under his feet for them. He justified them, the remnant, those who put their faith in him as Messiah. He justified them on the last day. He glorified them on the last day. He sanctified them on the last day. Just as we read about in Thessalonians, right? So that salvation, that justification, that gospel message of the first century was for national ethnic Israel under the old covenant. It was their message. Okay, here, and, and this is the crux of the matter. The reason that's true is because it was them and them alone who were the ones to come out from the old system that would pass away. That system had lasted for thousands of years. If you even want to go further back to Adam being cast out of covenant fellowship and that blood sacrifice system being instituted there right after the fall in Eden, those, that, the lineage of Adam eventually became the national ethnic people of Israel. So they'd been under that ministry of condemnation and death, all those animal sacrifices and all the death the substitutionary death that went with that system. They'd been under that for thousands of years. Christ was coming to conclude that, to wrap it up, to fulfill all of that so that something new could begin. He was setting them free from that. And those that were set free were the remnant of Israel. Those were the founding fathers of the new kingdom. So watch this. You're in Israel, you're living under the old covenant system, Messiah comes and you reject him. Therefore, you are not justified, right? You are not sanctified. You are not glorified. You are not part of the resurrected people, the new body, because you've rejected God's way, his new covenant way. You've rejected the kingdom that was to come. Those who believed were saved, rescued, out from that old system when it ended in A.D. 70. Who remained? The 144,000 of the book of Revelation. 
right? That's a symbolic number, but the all Israel that would be saved of Romans chapter 11. Those were the ones who remained, and they became, listen, the founding fathers of the new covenant system, not under Torah. Not under Torah. That's the whole point. That's the heartbeat of the New Testament. There was a group, a church, a community that was to come out from the old and into the new. And when the old passed away, the old heavens and the earth, only the new heavens and the new earth, the new covenant community of faith remained. And they were justified by faith and grace and out from under the boot of Torah and all that that system contained. I think the problem many of us have is that many people mistake the work of Christ in the modern church. They mistake the work of Christ as pertaining to the modern church, the church after AD 70, and it does not. In this way it does, that it brought an end to the old system so that they could begin the new system, the new kingdom. If it wasn't for the propitiation Right? If it wasn't for that appeasement of God's wrath upon national ethnic Israel under Torah, then the new kingdom could have never begun because Israel would have remained under that wrath. Someone had to wrap it up, bring it to a conclusion, finish it. Jesus was that someone. That was why he was their Messiah. So here they are trapped and imprisoned under this system for thousands of years, and boom, Messiah comes. He removes that guilt. He removes that debt. He removes that curse that they owed God. He ends that system. And now there's a new system, a resurrected people that came out from the old to life and started a brand new thing where there was no more guilt, no more curse. That's why Revelation 21 says there's no more curse, right? No more death, no more covenant death, no more Adam death. They were out of all that. We're not still waiting for something in the future. All that went down to say, well, we still have to be justified. How are we forgiven for our transgression? We were never under Torah. So we didn't need that just. I didn't need to be justified from my Torah transgressions. I did not need to have the propitiation of Christ's blood as the final sacrifice shed for me because I was not guilty under Mosaic law and under Torah or Adam death. Because I don't believe Adam was the first human being ever created, right? But he was a covenant man, just like Noah, and just like Abraham, just like Moses and the Israelites together, right? So they needed to be set free. They needed to be justified because they were under the old system. If Christ had not come, the Father couldn't say, hey, let's start a new kingdom while you're still remaining guilty under the old no, he had to wrap that up, conclude it. That's why Daniel chapter 9 says what it says. It says that 490 years remain for your people. Then you're done, finished, right? 490 years remain, right, to make up transgression, to make atonement for that transgression of Israel. Now, who, who, who did that? account for in the end who accounted for that the remnant those were the ones who were justified now today if i want to worship the god of israel the god of the bible i don't need to be justified the way that they did i don't need to be sanctified in the way that they did i don't need the blood of christ to cover me in the way that they did because i was never under the animal blood being temporarily covered he made it possible messiah jesus to make a new covenant people, but he had to save them out of the old covenant first. Once that happened in AD 70, a whole new thing began. A whole new ball game started. How do you get into that kingdom? By simple faith, by simply coming to God and saying, I want to love you. I want to honor you with my life. I want to love you and love my fellow man. I want to be good. What was it under the old system anyway? What, what did God expect of them under the old covenant system? Even Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor like you love yourself. That fulfills all the law and the prophets anyway. 
That's all God ever wanted. When you read through the scriptures, what do you see God harping on over and over again, especially in the Old Testament? Even Jesus does it in the Beatitudes. In Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7, in the, the whole Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about the heart. And he's, he's condemning the Pharisees because they have no love for the people. They have no true love from God that stems from an inward love. They were caught up in religion. They were caught up in their laws and their traditions that they put on top of the laws, the fence laws, that they added to the law of God. And Jesus condemned, saying, God never said to do or not do these things you're saying. You've heaped your traditions upon the law. And you've shut people out. The, the, I hope you're getting what I'm saying here. The wrath of God that was appeased at the final judgment in AD 70 was the wrath of God that should have been poured out upon national Israel, but Christ came and the Father poured it out upon him in their stead. Once that was finished and the judgment came and the old covenant system was erased, eradicated, wiped out, all that was left was the new kingdom that Christ made possible. And he called it the kingdom of God. Jesus was always talking about worshiping his father in the new kingdom. Christ came to make that possible. That was his work. And those Israelites who were saved became the founding fathers of the new covenant system, just like the old covenant system had the founding fathers, the 12 sons of Jacob. Right? And these founding fathers, if you were, were the 12 disciples. And out from them sprang the new covenant community. The wrath was for Israel and their Torah transgressions. Not for you and me in some future judgment because we were never and never will be under the system they were under. That concluded in AD 70. Okay? It was ethnic, national Israel that was under the ministry of condemnation and death because of Torah transgression. Not you and me. So there's no need for a future judgment, a future justification, a future propitiation, a future glorification. That new covenant body, that remnant of Israel, were, was glorified in AD 70 as they entered into that new kingdom in its fullness. And it's been going on ever since. And you and I enter by simple faith. That's the point of Galatians. That's the point of, of the entire New Testament, is that the, the complicated way to have fellowship with God under the old covenant system would be annihilated, and it would return to whatever it was pre-fall, Adam, walking in the garden with the Creator by simple faith. Now listen carefully here. This is going to offend some. But see if it doesn't bear out scripturally. See if it doesn't dovetail with what I'm saying. The cross, the sacrifice, the final sacrifice that Jesus made for Old Covenant Israel does not pertain to you and I beyond the fact that that cross made the New Covenant possible because it finalized, fulfilled concluded the old covenant system that was the work of the cross that's why he said it is finished we're not waiting for something future to be finished if it was finished it was finished that justification that glorification that propitiation that whole courtroom drama that was finished by jesus for them because they were under torah i'm being redundant but i have to to make the point so many people are confused about this the cross was a sacrifice, it was an altar that Jesus offered himself on to get Israel out from the boot upon their neck of Torah and that whole covenant system of death. Remember what Jesus said to them, I will be with you until the end of the age. There it is. My ministry is to be with you while you take this message of come out from under the old system while you take it for these 40 years to Israel and bring the remnant out to start the new kingdom, I will be with you via the Holy Spirit in this miraculous way 
so you can speak in other languages, so you can do miracles and so forth, so that you can prove that you are who you say you are and that God is working among you for these 40 years until you draw them out from the old covenant system. Because the people of God expected miracles. They'd seen them in their past. Israel had seen those miracles and God worked miracles among them and he was working miracles among them then to say, hey, this is me. This is God among you. That's why Paul believed, right? The whole Acts 9 thing was a miracle. So you see what I'm saying here? I will be with you until the end of the age. Then what? Then the new kingdom started and Christ's ministry was done. He brought it to a conclusion, right? Then it says in 1 Corinthians 15, he turned the kingdom over to the Father. Once he put all things, that is the old covenant system, under his feet, he crushed them, he destroyed them. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. God will soon crush Satan under your feet. That was the ministry of Christ. Once he did that, that's it for him. Now you're going to say, oh my gosh, he's saying that's it for Jesus. No. Well, what do I know what he's doing there in the invisible realm today? What do you know about it? I know this. He told the woman in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, that there's a time coming when they would worship the Father. Not in this mountain or in that mountain, but they would worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That's the new covenant. Not under Torah, but in spirit and in truth. Right? John chapter 14. I go to prepare a place for you. Then when did he come back? AD 70. Finished his work. He went. He prepared a place. The Father's house is the new Jerusalem. It's the new kingdom. It's the body of resurrected saints. And it's been going on ever since. Revelation 21. We see what we see back in Exodus with the tabernacle when it was built. The Shekinah glory came down among the people of Israel and dwelt with them. And they followed that Shekinah cloud as it led them. They didn't go anywhere the Shekinah cloud didn't go. Right? Well, that's what's happening in Revelation 21. God coming down in the New Jerusalem and tabernacling among men. It's about the Father in the kingdom. Jesus did something for the Father. His ministry was for the Father. You see? I'm not saying that Christ isn't important. He made the whole thing possible. And what the Father and the Son are doing right now as I speak, I have no idea. I don't know what their current ministry looks like. I don't know what, I don't know what they're doing in the invisible realm. Do you? In terms of specifics? But I know what they've asked of us, of all people of all times was to love him and love the neighbor, do good. We see what good and evil is in the Bible. We know what it is, even instinctively. Right? The law is written on our hearts, we know. Don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Don't commit adultery. You know what these things are. We know what the Ten Commandments are. Don't do wrong to people. And when you do ask, simply ask for God's forgiveness and move on. That's the beauty of the new kingdom. We don't have to go to the priest's. We don't have to have animal sacrifices offered on our behalf daily. We don't have to be cast outside the camp when we become unclean for something we touched or a sickness we might have and all the rest of it. That was the beauty of this. They're, they lived by simple faith in the garden. They transgressed the, the covenant at that point, which is don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whatever that was. That's not what we're talking about here. I've done other videos on that. But don't do this. Well, Adam did it. Eve did it. They're booted out of that covenant fellowship. And they entered into something other. And that lasted until Christ. The last Adam. See, that's the whole point. How, how often do we read about Adam in the New Testament? Christ being the second or the last Adam. How often do we read about the tree of life and about a restoration to that paradise? That was the whole point. Jesus coming to sum up the old so we could have the new. So what is the gospel today? Well, there is no gospel in the sense of their gospel. Their gospel was escape, flee from the wrath to come. We have no wrath to come. That judgment took place in AD 70. 
What is the gospel today? What is the good news today? The good news for them was, hey, you want to hear some good news? You don't have to be under this system of Torah anymore, the ministry of condemnation and death. But Christ came to fulfill that and start something brand new that everyone can come into. And what happened in church history after AD 70? What happened? Eventually, those founding fathers who were Israelites or proselytes into Israel... Those people died off as time went on, right? And who were the people coming into the kingdom of believing? Well, the national ethnic Israelites, by and large, rejected that message of that, that there was a new kingdom available for them. And so they went off and started some mutant form of Judaism, right? And non-Israelites were coming into the kingdom. 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, 1,500 years, 2,000 years, and here we are. And the kingdom today, by and large, is made up of people from all, not by and large, it's made up of people from all over the planet and always will be, right? It's that mustard seed that grew into the great mustard tree. The great tree that the birds of the air come and rest in their branches. So I hope that I'm going to conclude it here. I'm not negating the work of Jesus at all. I'm glorifying it. I'm praising it. But people say today you need to have Christ forgive you for your sins. I don't, I don't hold to that. That gospel was for them. It was Messiah, their Messiah, their King, right? Who sat on the throne of David for 40 years. Okay. Then he concluded that system of Israel with their Kings and so forth and started a new kingdom where there is no earthly king, right? But God is king. Oh, there's so much more to say about it, but I wanted to keep it as simple as I could today and as short as I could, because once I go past a half hour on these things, fewer, fewer and fewer people seem to watch them. There's so much more to say about this, but I hope this is enough for you to run with, right? I'm glorifying what Messiah did. He made it possible to have the new kingdom, but he was their Messiah, not mine, not yours. That's going to shock some of you, you know, but that's the tradition of men, that, that view. This is not scriptural in my estimation. Jesus came to do something for national, ethnic, old covenant Israel. He came to save them and rescue them out from their prison, from their bondage from their condemnation and death, spiritual death. Once they were made alive, he handed that kingdom over to the Father, and now we worship the Father in spirit and truth, just like he promised. Well, that's it for me today, guys. Take it, ponder it, read through the scriptures, and see if it doesn't hold up, okay? They were the church of Christ in that transition period until the body was resurrected, and they became the new kingdom body. During that 40-year period, they were, the, they were the ones who were trusting that Messiah would rescue them from the wrath of God to come. So they were the body of Christ at that point. We are not the body of Christ today. We're the resurrected body in the new kingdom. You can call that the body of Christ if you want because he began it. But that's deceptive in the sense that if someone comes to you today and says, I want to be a, I want to be a follower of the God of the Bible, we call that a being a Christian, a follower of Christ. And then we apply all these things that Christ applied to Old Covenant Israel. We try to apply them to people today and say, you need to be justified, right? You need to be glorified, or you're going to be glorified in the future sometime, but right now you need to be justified. You need to be sanctified. You need to be saved from the wrath of God that was to come. No, because it already came. That wrath was for Israel. There is no future wrath of God to come. There is no future lake of fire for the destruction of the wicked. That took place in AD 70, and that was the burning of the city of Jerusalem. That was the, the fire that destroyed the old covenant system, the judgment. Yes, that already all took place. But you're, of course people are going to get all screwed up when they say, when they try to take these passages that apply to Old Covenant Israel and their justification and their glorification and their need for the propitiation and their need for the shed blood of Christ and their need to, 
to go before the great white throne judgment and come out as either a sheep or a goat. You, tr you can't apply those things anymore. That's what full preterism should be teaching. Those things were applied, right? The judgment of the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, the great harvest, the marriage, the resurrection, the adoption, all that took place. And the goats were destroyed and the sheep were left. And then in essence, God says, okay, now let's begin something new. Okay, guys, um, let, I'm going to finish this. I'm in a different spot here, but uh, I had to go, and so I got somewhere else here, and I'm doing it in the Jeep. But here's the real mind blower, and I hope you're sitting down, because this is the real crux of the matter here. The resurrection of Jesus is described in the New Testament as a sign. It wasn't about his uh, physical body dying and coming to life. That wasn't the, the, the crux. That wasn't the, the, the emphasis was not on that. It was his dying to as an old covenant man and coming to life as a new covenant man being the first fruits from among the dead. In other words, he died to that Adam life. He died to that Moses life. He died to the life of Torah and came alive to the life out from those things. Now, now, now follow me here because this is a mind blower. If you were an Israelite in the first century before AD 70, and you wanted to enter into a new kingdom, and you wanted to enter into the new covenant fellowship with God, you could not because you were condemned. You were guilty under Torah. You would have had to have died physically because that was the requirement of the law. They were only temporarily covered over, their sins were, by the animal blood. But what was required from God was their death their biological death for their sins, for their law transgressions. So if Christ hadn't come and offered himself as the propitiation, if he had not redeemed them and bought them back from something, right, bought them out of something, then they could have never entered the new covenant kingdom when it arrived. They would have had to have died physically and then come back to life again so that it was like a brand new life. So they could start over again out from Moses, out from Torah, out from Adam and that ministry of condemnation and death. So Jesus did it for them. That's why it was a sign, right? It was an indication. In other words, I'm going to set you free from Torah, from that condemnation, from that unjustification, from that guilt that you have before God. And I'm going to pay the entire price in its entirety. Therefore, you'll be justified. You'll be sanctified. You'll, you can be glorified when the new kingdom comes. You see? So Jesus is saying, for you, I will go to that cross and be the sacrifice. In your stead, in your place, a substitutionary death and coming to life again. So that the Father will have it all summed up in me. I will have satisfied the wrath that he would have poured out upon you. He will pour out upon me and I will satisfy his judgment against you. And so you will have a sentence of not guilty passed on you without having to biologically die and come to life again. So you could be a new man out from Adam, out from under Torah. Isn't that mind blowing? Jesus did that for them, not for me, because he did that for them in order that they could enter the new covenant. He he purchased them back from something. He redeemed them. They were God's possession, then they were under this curse, and he purchased them out of the curse. I was never under that law curse. Neither were you. But Christ made it possible for them to come out and start this new kingdom that I am a part of and that you are a part of, hopefully, by simple faith and grace. That's the work of Christ. All right, guys, that'll do it for me. I'll see you next time. Ponder these things. Thank you.